So I'm joined this evening with good friend, Father Francis Mugabe from uh, Uganda, who's uh, I had the privilege of meeting in Loch Dirk last year, and we've had a few interviews now. And I just thought I'd pick Father's brains this evening, given that he's a uh, a doctor in canon law now. I have a license. <laughs> a license in canon law. Yes. Maybe someday they'll bring you back and give you the doctorate. But um, uh, I just thought we 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 touch on canon law and the Eucharist. And Father, I think you've prepared something. And if you just wanted to bring us through uh, your 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 thoughts on this and give us some education on on this topic in the context of canon law of the church. Thank you so much, Robert. I think we can begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, our Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for enabling us to go through everything that you have enabled us to do throughout this day. We thank you for the work. We thank you for the difficulties that you have enabled us to go through. We pray that this time may be beneficial and it may help us to know more of our faith. Make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much, Robert. So, um, I'm going to make a canonical treatment about the sacrament of the Eucharist. But I wish to first make a general view of the sacraments. The sacraments are in book four of the Code of Canon Law, and that is the sanctifying office. Uh, canon 840, eight and, Canon 804, tells us that the sacraments of the New Testament were instituted by Christ the Lord and entrusted to the church. As actions of Christ and of the church, they are signs and means by which the faith is expressed and strengthened. Worship is offered to God and our sanctification is brought about. And we know very well that the sacraments are seven. They're divided into three categories. We have the sacraments of initiation, the sacraments of commitment, the sacraments of healing. The sacraments of initiation are baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. The sacraments of healing, anointing of the sick, and, pen, and penance. Sacraments of commitment, sacrament uh, matrimony, and holy orders. A person who has not received baptism cannot validly receive or admitted, cannot be validly be admitted to any sacrament. The sacrament of baptism is the, is the sacrament that opens us to receive all the other sacraments. And we can reference, we can make reference to Canon 842. Uh, that is why you see that before, when you are going for First Holy Communion, confirmation, you will ask, can you please present to us your baptism certificate to prove that there is clear or that there is, it is clear that somebody received this sacrament. And that is why if they are not sure whether you received the sacrament of baptism, they will have a condition of baptism. And that one, actually, you can make reference to Canon 845. And the sacrament imparts on it on the person who receives it. And in the Ribo character. That is why the sacraments of baptism and confirmation cannot be repeated. And th this brings me to what I was saying of the condition of baptism. If they are not sure that you receive these sacraments, then they give a condition of baptism. I think that is a, a bit of an introduction about the sacraments. Now, I go to the treatment of today about the sacrament of the Eucharist. The Blessed Eucharist, Canon, 807, Canon 897, tells us that the most august sacrament is the Blessed Sacrament, is the Blessed Eucharist, in which Christ the Lord himself is contained, offered, and received, 
and by which the church continually lives and grows. The Catholic Church lives and grows because of the greatest treasure that we have of the sacrament of the Eucharist. The Eucharistic sacrifice, therefore, is the memorial of the death, resurrection of the Lord, in which the sacrifice of the cross is forever perpetuated, is the summit and source of all worship and Christian life. And that is why every Sunday we celebrate Easter. I wouldn't wish to go so much into aspects of liturgy and what, but every Sunday we celebrate Easter because we are celebrating the memorial of the death, resurrection of the Lord. And therefore, it is our duty as Christian, as, as Christ faithful, to hold the blessed sacrament with highest honor and dignity. We make reference to Canon 898. Now, this call takes me to who is the minister of the blessed sacrament? Canon 900 clearly says that the only minister who in the person of Christ can bring into being the sacrament of the Eucharist is a validly ordained priest. It is only a validly ordained priest. And this also, a valid ordained priest also includes the, the bishop as well. And that is why every time before a priest celebrates the Eucharist, especially if a priest is not known in an area, it would be prudent that the pastor of the place or the priest in that area asks for the celebrate to prove that this priest is a validly ordained priest, is in communion with his bishop or with his, with his order or the religious order. And he, that they know that what he's going to celebrate is the Eucharistic celebration. And it is the duty of us priests every now and then to offer a mass for anyone living and dead. It is always encouraged, but actually that one will make reference to Canon 901. It is always encouraged that in every sacrifice of the, the Mass, a priest goes with an intention. Dear uh, faithful, always give these intentions to the priest, whether for yourself. We don't only pray for, for the dead, but also to pray, to pray for ourselves. We have different needs. We have challenges. We have sicknesses. So it is always good that a priest goes with a need. I think I should also, as regards the minister of the Eucharist, there is a very big challenge today of who are the ordinary ministers of the sacrament of the Eucharist who is supposed to distribute Holy Communion? Who is not supposed to distribute Holy Communion? When we go to Canon 910, Canon 910 clearly states who are the ordinary ministers of the sacrament of Holy Communion, or who are the ordinary ministers of Holy Communion. The ordinary ministers of Holy Communion is a bishop, a priest, and deacon. That is paragraph one. Paragraph 2 says, the extraordinary minister of Holy Communion is an acolyte. An acolyte, there are people who are preparing for major orders, so they receive the, 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 the ministry of acolyte, lect and acolyte. Or another Christian faithful, deputed according, in accordance with the law, according to Canon 230, paragraph 3. 130 is in the section of Christ is faithful. And what does paragraph three of that canon say? It says that when, when, when there is need, when, when, the, when the need of the church require and ministers are not available, let people, even though they are not lectors or acolytes, can, sup, can supply certain of their functions. That is the exercise of the ministry of the word preside over liturgical prayers, confer baptism, and distribute Holy Communion in accordance with the provision of the law. Now, this is where sometimes we go wrong. 
In case there is a sacrifice of the mass, they are priests and the Eucharistic ministers are there. I know many people wouldn't wish to, to, to hear this, but it is the reality. It is the work of the priest. It is the work of the deacon. There is no reason why a priest should sit down and the Eucharistic minister comes and distributes Holy Communion because this he, he or she comes in order of necessity. Why does the church bring this? It brings that in a case, maybe the, the congregation is too big and the priest is one for a matter of time. Then there can be people who assist this priest to distribute Holy Communion. But we on a decision day, there are hundreds of priests, all, you know, handful of priests. Dear priests, let us do our work. We were ordained for that. Go distribute communion. Why? <laughs> why would, I know people wouldn't wish to hear this, but why would, for example, a minister of communion go and open the tabernacle? When you're the priest, you are there. Doesn't take any minute. Doesn't. Doesn't take, because this is our work. We are ordained for that. And that is, this is the most important aspect of us as priests. And that is why even when a pastor, a parish priest is going to be, you know, installed as a parish priest, there are instruments of power he is given canonically. One of the instruments he is given is the key to the tabernacle because that is the center. Everything moves around around that. So I think we should put that very into, 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 into consideration. Then the other thing is about communion. It would be good always that people partake of the communion that is celebrated the, 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 the body of Christ that is consecrated in that particular mass. What was the intention of keeping Jesus in the tabernacle? That in case there are people who are sick in the community, they can easily bring this viaticum, take it to the sick. So in case there is an option, you know the congregation as a priest, you know the numbers of people that come, or you make an approximation. It's always good that People communicate from that very Christ that is celebrated in that sacrifice of the mass. Participation in the blessed sacrament. Any baptized person who is not forbidden by law may and must be admitted to Holy Communion. Now this goes into depending on the different parts of the world like where i come from people who are not legally married they don't go for communion that is a so sometimes according to law, we also have to to know the area what does the episcopal conference say about that and 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 all that that is very very important now what are the species to be used? The most important species that must be used in the sacrament of the Eucharist. Bread and wine, unleavened bread. The most, Canon 924, the most holy sacrifice of the Eucharist must be offered in bread and in wine to which a small quantity of water is to be added. Paragraph 2 says the bread must be whitened only and recently made so that there is no danger of corruption. Paragraph 3 says the wine must be natural, made of, from grapes of the wine and not corrupt. Uh, dear listeners, those of you who are very observant, you go in the, ch in the churches or in the parishes and observe, be observant on the bottles of those wines. There is always a word of the Episcopal Conference. This wine has been approved for, for liturgical services according to the Episcopal Conferences of this country. Why? That regulates abuses. 
that there is a supplier and this wine has been approved or there are people who it has been approved to be used for 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 eucharistic celebrations in now let me go to to us what should be used during the sacrifice of the mass in celebrating and administering the sacrament of the eucharist the priest and deacons at where the sacred vestments prescribed by the rubric now here is a problem sometimes we 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 tend to rationalize things you know for me i would encourage as a priest if the vestments are there why put on a stall only put on the chasuble put on the stall so that you are a priest but the, the first thing must begin from how do i come to the chapel dear christians provoke us if, if, for example, you see me one day coming for the mass, I'm not putting on my clerical shirt. I'm not putting on my sutan. Why me a clerical shirt? Provoke me, give me a gift of the clerical shirt. Because it is, I'm a minister of the church. And when I'm coming for this important celebration, I must be presentable to show that I, my identity must be seen so that everybody sees my identity. So, in administering, we shouldn't, you know, say, I think it is okay. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is kind. Therefore, I can put on any way. And even when I don't put on that, don't you think the Lord will come? No. <laughs> the, the church has clearly put this into, you know, and it has a reason. Put on the alb, put on the stall, put on the chasuble, and that's it. Because we have them. And the, the church has, has provided. Why? Dress smartly as a priest. If, if we get time to go for, you know, and dress on parties and what, why don't we dress when we are going for this most important, you know, function? We are going to meet our God. We are going to meet Jesus. And as a priest, I'm going to bring Jesus to the people. So please, let us be you know, let us dress, let our identity be shown. As regards the Eucharistic celebration, it is strongly recommended, especially during the consecration, that the the words of the consecration must be only said by the priest. There is a tendency these days that, for example, the, the, the words of consecration, take this all of you and eat of it. Especially the words said to the bread and to the wine. That sometimes the Christians, because this, they have become familiar with these words, they, they follow. But it, is, it wouldn't be very, it is, not, it is not proper according to the law. The place for the cele for celebration of the Eucharistic cele celebration and maybe the distribution. The celebration and the distribution of the Eucharist may take place on any day at any hour except those which are excluded by liturgical laws. We are going to meet the Lord. We are going to meet the King of Kings. Let us make our places where we are going to celebrate the Eucharist decent. Uh, I think here in Europe, you don't have cases, but like in Africa, we have cases where people don't have a church and they pray under a tree. But you will find that it is upon the priest or the catechist who prepares for this sacrament of the Eucharist, that they prepare a place that befits the Lord. Have a clean altar linen, have a good table where the Lord is going to. 
Is it for us who, have, who come from cultures where people respect the king? When a king is going to visit a place, people will do all sorts of things to organize for the king. They will dress made smartly in their cultural attire because the king is coming. But here, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings is coming to us. Why don't we prepare a place that befits him so that we can give him a befitting sacrifice? As regards reservation and veneration of the Blessed Sacrament, the Blessed Sacrament must be reserved in the cathedral church or its equivalent or in every parish church and in a church or oratory attached to the House of Religious Institute or Society of Catholic Life. Maybe paragraph two of that canon, 934, says that it may be reserved in a bishop's chapel or by permission of the local ordinary in other chapels, in other churches, oratories, and chapels. This also brings some bit of confusion that now today, so many people are asking for to have the blessed sacrament in their houses. It is a, well, some people do it, but it is not proper and the law doesn't. The law is a, is a bit, you know, I wouldn't so much want because uh, I might bring some bit of contradictions in that, but uh, Sometimes people accept it, but it's not, it's not all that proper. In sacred places where the Blessed Sacrament is reserved, there must be always someone who is responsible for it. And as far as possible, a priest is to celebrate Mass there at least twice a month. We shouldn't keep the Lord in an isolated place, in a place that is not secure to avoid abuses to the Blessed Sacrament. In several places, many churches have been attacked and the Lord has been, you know, has been attacked and uh, abused. So it is always important. Canon 935 says, it is not lawful for anyone to keep the Blessed Sacrament in personal custody or to carry it around unless there is an urgent pastoral need and the prescription of the decision bishop are observed. <laughs> Today, there are so many abuses as regards to this, especially people who say that they are praying for people, they are casting demons, they are what and what. For pastoral reasons, even as a priest, for pastoral reasons, you can carry, you are going to take Vietcom to the sick, carry the blessed sacrament. You are coming from outstation, yes, go. Take the blessed sacrament and take, but why do you move with the blessed sacrament in the car every time? You know, you are with Jesus, you are having all kinds of talks, you are having all kinds of things, and then to, to avoid abuses, please let us make reference to that canon 935. 936 says, in a house of religious institute or a house of piety. The blessed sacrament is to be observed only in the church or principal oratory attached to the house. Even, even if you have a strong piety, you have a strong devotion to the blessed sacrament, but you are not allowed to keep the blessed sacrament in your custody unless you have been explicit permission has been granted by the ordinary of that that of that diocese canon 938 says the blessed sacrament is to be reserved habitually in only one tabernacle of a church or oratory the tabernacle in which the blessed sacrament is reserved should be situated in a distinguished place in a church or oratory, a place which is conspicuous, suitable, suitably adorned, and conducive for prayer. People must come and meet Jesus, but is it a conducive place for prayer? Is it a quiet place? Is there a conducive atmosphere? 
And this goes to, to the pastors of, you know, of particular parishes that we must make the environment so conducive that uh, it gives enough time for, for people to pray and to meditate and to have time with the Lord. Canon 940, a special lamp is to burn to be is to burn continuously before the tabernacle, in which the blessed sacrament is reserved to indicate and to honor the presence of the Lord. Very important. And this we must keep an eye to it. Canon 942 says it is recommended that in these churches or at this. There is to be each year a solemn exposition of the blessed sacrament for an appropriate time, even if it is not to be continuous, so that the local community may more attentively meditate on and adore the Eucharistic ministry. And adore the Eucharistic mystery. This exposition is to take only if a fitting attendance of a faithful is for us seen and the prescribed norms are to be observed. I think this is uh, very clear. That there is a, to, so that people have this pass, you know, with the Lord and uh, they, they have more time to, 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 to talk to, to Jesus, to talk to their Lord. The minister of exposition of the blessed sacrament and the Eucharistic blessing is a priest or a deacon. In special circumstances, the minister of exposition and disposition alone must, without the blessing, is an acolyte, an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion, or any other person deputed by the local ordinary in accordance with the regulation of the decision bishop. Now, sometimes I may be there as a priest and say, no, but it is okay. The extraordinary minister of the Eucharist can expose the blessed sacrament. It is wrong. When the priest is there, the deacon is there, he is the minister for exposition of the blessed sacrament. And however, because of this, we shouldn't just take it that we abuse. You know, these days you see people moving around with Jesus almost everywhere. <laughs> and the following canon 944 says that wherever there is judgment in the judgment of the decision bishop, it can be done a procession through the streets is to be held, especially on the solemnity of Corpus Christi as a public witnesses, as a public witness of veneration of the blessed sacrament. Sometimes, you know, people mislead us and, no, but we must have exposition in the streets so that people know that Jesus is very powerful. No, explicit permission from the ordinal of the bishop, of, of the ordinal of the diocese must be out and it must take, it must be, must be received. I think we can talk about that. Maybe we can talk about the offering made for the celebration of the Eucharist. So that is not, so that is not important now. Well, I just maybe touch on the reception of the Eucharist because I know there's a lot of confusion about how we should uh, reverently receive the Eucharist in in our church, um, and uh, maybe we just reference what canon law currently says. The proper way, I think there is no pro. The proper way should be reception on the tongue. But sometimes, because of the of the now, like we were for COVID times, and because of such conditions, then we we recommend on the on the on the hands. And that is why, because when the consecration is finished, now we are with Jesus. So any spot that comes from 
Jesus. That is already, we, we must be conscious. And that is why in some churches, you will see that when people are receiving communion, there is always a server with a pattern. Mm -hmm. That in case there are some spots that are coming from Jesus, those spots get on this pattern and then it is cleaned. And then that also goes that even when they have cleaned, you know, even the things that are used, the purificator and what, you'll find that in the traditional churches, there is a display, there is a place where they pour this water first before it is poured elsewhere because of the sacredness of the of the of the Eucharist. Yes, of course, sometimes we say, no, it is okay, the Lord is good, you can receive as you want, but I we leave that at that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe about the, the offering. In accordance, Canon 945 says, in accordance with the approved custom of the church, a priest who celebrates or conservates mass may receive an offering to apply to apply to the mass for a specific intention. It is honestly recommended to, to the priest that even if they do not receive an offering, they celebrate mass for the intention of Christ faithful, especially for those in need. Even if I haven't received any intention, but I have an obligation to pray for, 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 for my for, for the people every every time. Christ faithful who make an offering. Canon 946 says, Christ faithful who make an offering so that the mass can be celebrated for the intention, contribute to the good of the church. And by that offering, they share in church's concern for the support of its ministers and its activities. Through these intentions, the, the activities of the church are supported and also the sustenance of the priest is supported. I think this works most especially for countries where priests don't receive a, a salary what so because of these mass intentions. And sometimes bishops request for these intentions from various organizations and what so that they can support their priests. Separate masses are to be applied for the intentions of those of those for whom each of the offering has made has been made, how even if it is small. You see, flexibility of the law must be must be also applied. For example, here in Spain, a mass intention a stipend is 10 euro. But uh, there might be somebody who needs an intention, a special intention to be prayed for. And he has five euro. It is not, it's not because you must, because he has an intention, he has the will, but he can't afford the 10 euro. So therefore it is okay that you, the law, the law is flexible about it because it, it, the most important thing is the salvation of this, of the soul. This person wants his intention to be prayed for and uh, she doesn't have, but he has the will. Therefore, receive that small offering and then you offer his, his or intention. One who is obliged to celebrate and apply mass for an intention for those who have made for those who have made an offering is to bound by this obligation. And if even if through no fault of his of his own, the offering received has been lost. When a priest receives an intention from somebody, he has an obligation. He's not doing a privilege for that person. I think you know the difference between a privilege and an obligation. A privilege, somebody, according to the lay privilege is something that somebody, it is upon the person who is offering to, to give or not to do it, but an obligation. Somebody must do it because he's entitled to do that. Therefore, when a Christian gives you an offering, you're entitled. You have an obligation to fulfill 
that this other one I will not treat it because it concerns mainly the, the priests. So I will I don't know whether it is okay. I, I yeah. talk about this. Okay. Yeah. So canon 951 says a priest who celebrates the number of masses on the same day may apply each mass for the intention for which an offering was made. Subject, however, to the rule that apart from Christmas Day, he may retain for himself the offering for only one mass. The other is to transmit to purposes prescribed by the ordinary, while allowing for some compensation on the ground of extinct title. If I receive, for example, many offerings today and the uh, actually I can't celebrate these masses out of charity share with a brother who doesn't have the intentions or you you take it to the ordinary of the diocese because there needs that the diocese or the bishop may need to work on and it is from these <laughs> mass intentions that these needs can be worked on a priest Paragraph two of that, a priest who on the same day concelebrates another mass may not under any title accept an offering for that mass. I think that is clear, unless you have any other questions. Yeah. Mm. No, it's, it's, it's very interesting because um, a, a, a lot of Catholics don't understand um, some of these um questions in canon law this discussion for example when my father died uh, in ireland people were giving me uh, sympathy cards that they would buy in a bookstore and okay. the the sympathy card has like this stamp of a priest signature mm -hmm. and now it's not and now it's not a mass card it's a sympathy card and it says portion of this money goes to a um some charity and this, this in Ireland, there's this massive phenomenon. I'm, I'm surprised Irish bishops haven't addressed it, where this particular card is given out. I mean, I had five of these cards. And, uh, and then you will have a mass card where somebody goes to a priest and says, can you say a mass for, um, for a specific uh, person? Mm. And they put the, the name on the card. Um, so I, whenever I want a mass said, I will always only go to a specific priest. Like when, when my mother-in-law died, I, I, I messaged you, said, Father, can I, can you say a mass for my mother-in-law? And I, and I send you, uh, here's a, here's a donation for that mass. And so I know you've received a donation. I've given you the name of the person and I know you will celebrate the mass. It's it's very clear, but many people don't understand on oh, they go into in Ireland's Eason's as the bookstore and they buy sympathy card thinking that a mass is going to be said. They think this is a mass card and it's not. And um and it's very, very sad in that situation that, you know, it's important that, you know, as Catholics, we 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 go and, you know, request that a mass is said for that person of a priest. And then we help help the church uh, in, 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 in some way uh, as well, you know, so, so that uh, um, you know, the, the, we pray for the our deceased souls. OK, now I think. In most parishes and uh, for purposes of order, there must be somewhere where some of the things are registered, some of the mass yeah. type are registered. And actually, for us as priests, when you say you must have a book where you, you register the masses that you have, you have or, you know, you, you have said on a particular day for what intention is for a day, for what. And for purposes of register in the parish, all those things must be recorded. And it is recommended that at least once in a while, once that the bishop goes through these books to make a follow-up, how many people pray for each other in this parish? How many mass stipends do they receive? How many people are confirmed? How many people receive Holy Communion? 
So in the proper sense, that should be should be the the order. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But I think, in my view, it would be good that like these cards, mass mass cards and sympathy cards that they shouldn't be given to anybody to hmm, to sell. No. No. Because uh, eventually it might it might bring in abuses because somebody can come and claim to be a priest. Yes. He buy he buys so people buy and the people start giving him so he celebrates fake masses which is not exactly exactly not, so I think there would be places that are designated in a parish that or in a bookshop that in this bookshop you find mass cards in this yeah. in the in yes. the office in the parish office you find mass cards and they are recorded for proper yes. accountability and yeah. uh, avoiding abuses. Yeah. Yes. In in Ireland, it's a very ma it's a it's a it's very common. But in other countries, in Poland, they don't give you a mass card. It doesn't exist. They give you uh, a piece of paper Where are saying, you, right? "Yeah, your mass will be offered on such a day for this intention." Uh, and and when I went to the shrine of the divine, the uh, the the uh, sister um faustina's where sister faustina's buried i got the nuns they they register the masses there and then they give you a piece of paper saying what days the mass would be offered and so forth and um it's so i suppose in different countries they have different ways of, of managing yes. it every country has a way of managing yeah and, uh, and i think that culture is more of here of course like home, yeah. I worked in a parish for five years before I came to Europe for studies. But our people don't have that, mm. that 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 culture. But that also depends on the group of people that evangelize that particular that particular area. You'll yeah. find that where the military missionaries evangelize, they have a different way of looking at things. Where the white fathers evangelize, they have a different way. So it is a it is it is a matter of sensitizing. Yeah. I think here in Europe the culture of mass intentions is is strong than yeah. in some parts, yeah, like where yeah. I come from. Yes. Okay. Uh, and maybe there would be issues of uh, maybe celebrating mass with a, a person of church which is not in communion with the Catholic Church, a priest con celebrating, and what? We, when we read Canon 908, a Catholic priest are forbidden to cel con celebrate the Eucharistic, to celebrate the Eucharist with a priest or minister of church as well as just communion, which communities which are not in full communion with the Catholic Church. Yeah. Yes. So I have gone for a function, therefore, if you have seen him as a priest, hey, you can join. Oh, oh the, there is a reverend who has come, he can join us freely. No. Yeah. No. You know, there is there is a difference. Sometimes uh, people say, hey, before the communism, Papa says, I think we can we can do this. And that no, not on, you know, as a Catholic church, we should have our treasures and we should do, hold our treasures dearly. Yes. Yeah. I think any other question? I'm um, not at the moment. I, I suppose if people have more questions on canon law, put them in the chat below and we can do another episode just to delve into this so that we can educate uh, Catholics a little bit more. Because I think it's, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I've often seen priests sit down at mass and, and laity give out communion and, and we forget you know the different roles and then we're scratching ourselves. Why aren't there vocations to the priesthood when you know, sadly, some priests don't don't live that um, the the mission that they're called to, especially when it comes to treating the body of our Lord. So uh, it's good that we we have uh, we have the the canon law to give us clear guidelines on on how we should work. Well, 
I wouldn't say I, I'm not going to to make any judgment, mm -hmm. but the law clearly says the ordinary minister of Holy Communion is a priest and deacon. These days, there is a. Mm -hmm. I think people are, are more. We are trying to push responsibilities to others because we. Mm -hmm. It is, we want to share responsibilities. All of us have to be involved. But we have to go back and see what was the 1917 code saying? What was in the first Vatican Council? We very well know that the, the faithful involvement in the Eucharistic celebration was limited. Mm -hmm. Vatican Council too opens, you know, like Lumen Gentium talks about this clearly. And then, so when it opens, and now with the scarcity of priests, and they say now, we bring more of the, of the faithful into the service. It doesn't mean that the role, the responsibility, the duties of the priest must be transferred to the Christians. If the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, is the work of the priest. Yeah. And actually, <laughs> even to go and pick Jesus from the from the tabernacle, it should be a responsibility of a priest. When you're celebrating mass as a priest, why would any person go and pick from I know people might are going to 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 do it, but that, that is that is segregation. No, it's not segregation. It is, it is a law. I read, I, 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 one time somebody was asking me that very question and I asked him, when you go to a hospital, there are different people who do different roles. You will find somebody who will take the pressure and the what. And when you go for an operation, will you feel comfortable when the nurse is doing the operation and the doctor is just looking on? Of course not. So, for me, I would think it is not a matter of segregation, but it is a matter of people have been ordained for this responsibility. When we were ordained as priests, we are smeared with chrism in our hands to bless and to give holy things, to distribute holy things to people. And that is why the, the code clearly says, actually, like I said, Canon 230, paragraph 3, Clearly stipulates it very well. And on 230 paragraph 3, where the needs of the church require and ministers are not available. Now, the ministers are available. The ministers are available. Why? If the ministers for that particular work are available, there is no danger of death. The minister, yeah. if there is no danger of death, and there is no, there is not, there is no necessity because the ones who are supposed to do the work are there. Yeah. So why, why do I transfer my responsibility to another person who should be there in a case of emergency? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that. Yes, the work of the the, the Eucharistic ministers. Is good, but in case the, the deacon, the mm. priest is there. Yes, and the numbers are not like on a, on a daily mass, there are 20 people. Why would the Eucharistic minister show up? Mm. I'm not saying that I'm belittling their, their responsibilities. Get me right. But we all, we must also know the the, the, the the particular rules of the diocese and the what does the Episcopal Conference of the particular countries say about this? But according to the law, 910 clearly states, states that. But I would think also um, sometimes some Christians wouldn't feel good to see priests seated and they see a person distributing communion. Of course, some Christians wouldn't feel good about it. So mm. let us do our responsibilities, you know, very... Yeah. Was like like that canon clearly said it is in cases of 
emergence and ministers are not available or insufficiency of ministers, like then people can help in so that people don't lack that the souls yeah. are fed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that also applies to the sacrament to taking viaticum to, to the sick. Yes. I would encourage that uh, most of the times that uh, the priest takes the viaticum. Why? You might reach there and this person requires to receive penance. Yeah. So once in a while, uh, my dear brother priests, let us go take viaticum to the sick. You will find that in some parishes, you know, there is one person, a, a, you know, a Eucharistic minister who takes communion to, to, to the sick throughout the year. But the priest has never visited. When do these people receive uh, mm -hmm. the sacrament of penance? And it is recommended according to the law. We shall treat, we have not, I will not talk more about the sacrament, but it is recommended in this, at least once a year, especially in the time of, <laughs> in the time of Holy Week. Yes. Yes, that at least. So if this sick person, you, a full year, he has not seen you as a priest to receive the sacrament of penance, but he's feeding. But he's, he's not washing, he's feeding. So yeah. you, you are putting this person in a danger not to, re to, to receive Jesus when he's not properly disposed or when he's not in the state of yeah. grace. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks very much, Father, for, for starting off this series. And uh, if people want to leave their comments below on any topics that they'd like to discuss, like us to discuss in canon law so that we can educate Catholics up. Um, because, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, there, there seems to be some confusion in the church and definitely some confusion in Ireland and on some of these aspects. Um, so that, uh, you know, because, uh, when, when, when some priests come into a parish and they, and they try to work within canon law, a lot of laity get annoyed when, you know, it says with the priest says, look, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to use Eucharistic ministers this week. I remember one priest, he, he when he went, to, into a new parish 24 eucharistic ministers came up to give out the eucharist <laughs> and it wasn't like there was thousands of people there and and, uh, and 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 then the priest has to say well i don't need all of you i can i can maybe do it one and that's it you know and uh, i think the confusion has has grown and grown and um and we we, we kind of, yeah well um, for me i would think sometimes it is a it is a matter of, for example, you have a certain group, ushers in a parish. Once in a while, continuous, you know, continuous training to these people, informing them about their responsibilities is very, very important. Yes, it's very, very important. Sometimes, Yes, somebody knows I'm a Eucharistic minister, and therefore, when there is a, a mass, I must go and distribute. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you don't blame this person because this is what he or she knows. So yeah. it is upon us as ministers to tell these people, yes, judge. For example, in case you see there are so many priests and uh, you see them at the altar, please don't come. Just, just. Tell this it is our responsibility to talk to these people. You have seen five priests on the altar. As a yes. but don't come because yes. now these ones can do the very work that you you you, you talk to these people politely. Yes. Yes. You would come, but now these five, these priests are there. They can do this work very well. So when you see them at the altar, please don't come. Just stay cold. Then when they are away, you will come and and do this responsibility. I think when you when you talk to them politely. You know, not in a rude way. Of course, I know canonists are not like because they always give the they always they always talk things that people don't want to to hear. So, talking to these people politely is very 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 important. But also, the part of the 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 lay people. 
be open to learning and be open to flexibility. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because uh, sometimes also priests find it hard. You know, you say, yeah. tell somebody, yes, now there's another priest. But no, but I am supposed to do it. I know yeah. I'm supposed to do it. Yeah. And then, I think there is also something I forgot to talk about. I have seen it in several places, especially with the with the choir members, that uh, time for communion comes because people are singing. Therefore, they they don't receive communion during that time. Mass is finished, and then they then they come that they are coming to receive. The law says that, uh, for example, during mass, it is not obligatory. You'll go, you'll go in the instructions of the Roman Missal. If you have a breviary, you will check about that in the celebration. It is not obligatory and it's not mandatory that during the reception of communion that people should sing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And actually, silence is recommended mm -hmm. that people have a meditative, they meditate on Jesus they have received, that uh, they have a, a, a prayerful moment with Jesus, they talk to Jesus that has come into their lives, they have a moment with him. Yes. And that is why in that instructions of the Roman Missal, you'll find that in a parish, it is, it is not recommended that every day, every time people should sing Thanksgiving song. No. Let people have a moment of silence. Yeah. They reflect. Because in the moment of silence, people have people have come to church with so many troubles. Mm -hmm. There are so many people who have come with troubles. There are some who have come with sicknesses. They, they need to talk to Jesus more deeply, more closely. Have you given them time? Yes, the music is good, the singing is good, but have you given them time to meditate? Yeah. So I would think that that is proper. So in case maybe the choir, people, I would think maybe they come first and receive communion, then they go and and sing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. Perfect. Okay. Father, I think we'll wrap it up here. And uh, I do ask people, leave your comments below if you want to uh, for a topic to be discussed out and we can prepare it. And uh, obviously, if you want to support Father Francis in, in the small work we're doing, he's doing when he returns home, maybe uh, in getting an adoration chapel or a school or something going where he's from, it would be good. You know, obviously, it's good to make connections and and to uh, understand uh, um, the needs in, of other Christian communities. So if you want to get involved, you know, please reach out. But uh, uh, I just thought we'd we'd continue on this discussion uh, for a few more weeks and see what people think of 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 trying to understand better our faith and how the church church's code of canon law uh, works and how it's what it says on different aspects of our faith. Thank you so much, Robert. I think or maybe next time we shall deal with the questions and uh, yeah. maybe next week if we have time we can uh, marriage is a bit big so, mm. and it's a very sensitive maybe we can touch on those aspects of marriage the institution, the institution what is marriage according to the code yeah. maybe um, factors that can lead to annulment what, what is the matter, what conditions what preparations people need yeah, it will depend on what all we can touch on another sacrament or another aspect yeah. or governance of the church, depending on the interests of yeah. the, the viewers. Yeah, thank you so much, and uh, we can have a closing prayer. Yeah, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God, our Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for enabling us to come to the end of this day. As we go to retire, we ask that you continue to protect us, to protect our families, 
to touch us, to touch our needs, to touch those who are yearning to know you. Touch the sick. May your precious blood always cover us in our different challenges, in our different journeys. But above all, that tomorrow we continue to do your work. We continue to commend to you our brothers and sisters that have come back to you today. Lord, you grant them eternal rest. And we continue to commend to you our family members, friends that Lord you called and those that have not reached heaven through our prayers, Lord, you may receive them. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may God bless us all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless. Thank you, Father. God bless.